kayak kamu nih gambar ini. Okay, welcome everybody to our fourth and final environmental justice brown bag seminar. We'll give another minute to just let everyone get into the room. So as you may notice, we have a little bit of a different format to the Zoom meeting today. We're um, operating in a sort of normal Zoom meeting rather than the webcast version to allow for a little bit more interaction during the Q&A part of our talk with our speaker. So during, we'll hold all questions till the end of the seminar. And at the end, we'll ask you to please use the chat function or the raise hand function. And Karen Gutierrez and I, myself will call on folks to ask their question and um, we'll be able to have a little bit more back and forth between our speaker and everyone here today. Um, so we also wanted to start with a brief audience poll to get your feedback on this series so far. So we'll go ahead and start that poll and then we'll dive into our talk following that. So we have three quick questions for folks who are here. Um, the first is, which of the seminars have you attended? You should be able to select all that apply. The second question is, would you attend future brown bag seminars on Delta social science topics? And then the third question asks for your input on what topics you'd like to see in the future. Again, a select all that apply. So we really appreciate a little um, input on how we move this seminar series forward in the future. So um, I can't submit it because I'm not, I have not attended any of the seminars before. There's right, a, there's a okay. not a none. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks for, for that um, feedback. So uh, that's fine, we'll, we'll let you, um, you can just go ahead and click A if you want and then proceed to the following questions. And we'll maybe discount the A <laughs> attendance list a little bit. All right, lots of responses coming in. Okay, so while we leave that open for another minute, um, we can advance to the next slide, please. So before we see the answers to everyone's um, responses on what types of topics we'd like to see focused in the future, I will let everyone know that we have a, another seminar series planned for early 2022 focused on governance in the Delta. Um, so we'll have three seminars, uh, again, one per month, and the three topics will focus on environmental governance, collaborative governance, and adaptive governance. And the idea here is to really, again, bring more of the social science perspective into these topics in the Delta. Um, each of the seminars will be a panel of speakers representing different perspectives from um, academic speakers to different levels of government and to community groups. So we look forward to sharing the information for those and hope to see many of you there. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Karen to introduce our final speaker in our environmental justice brown bag series. Okay. Thank you, Jez, and hello everybody. And thank you for spending your lunch with us and joining us for the last of our, of our environmental justice uh, series talks. And today we are joined by Professor Lievanos, who is an associate professor at the University of Oregon in the Department of Sociology. He earned his PhD from UC Davis, where he led some foundational scholarship on environmental justice in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. His current research focuses on the organizational, institutional, demographic, and spatial dynamics 
of environmental and housing market inequalities and on the social movements and policy processes that attempt to address such inequalities in the United States. So some of his current projects include a focus on inequality and community type pollution exposure, energy and electrical grid access, real estate and housing, just such as today's talk, food security, uh, food security and climate justice, as well as EJ policy development and implementation. So with that said, I'll let Professor Lee Reynolds take it away. A moment, sorry, just getting this. Thank you for uh, everyone for um, coming today and hopefully, um, you know, I'll be sharing some of my work with you and then also looking uh, forward to learning <clears throat> from uh, many of you who, right, are living and working in the Delta. I've now removed, um, right, in Oregon. And so um, I'll be sharing, you know, what I've learned over the years and hopefully, you know, in our discussion, we could talk more uh, as well. Um, go to the show here. Um, Everyone see the, uh, my uh, slides okay? Yeah, okay. So some acknowledgements just um, where I am right now on the Kalapui Alihi uh, here in Eugene, Oregon, and just acknowledging uh, whose uh, lands, uh, historical and ancestral lands I'm on and, and who continues to um, contribute to um, Eugene area and rest of Oregon. You can see more uh, in terms of our land acknowledgement from the University of Oregon. Uh, to the Kalapuya peoples. Um, I also want to thank uh, the Delta Stewardship Council, particularly Jessica and Karen and staff uh, for inviting me, uh, particularly in looking at the, um, you know, the, just the, the folks who have participated in the webinar series thus far. Um, it's, it's great to be included amongst them. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come back and, and share, um, you know, what I've learned over the years. So thank you. Uh, some background. Um, so one thing that when we think about uh, environmental justice, and again, you've already had the, um, the excellent presenters thus far kind of talk, you know, in, uh, in broad terms of environmental justice around uh, the United States and indeed around the world uh, from various perspectives. I'm going to focus in mostly on California and the Bay Delta. That um, is more of my area of expertise and kind of what I've learned uh, uh, going back to grad school, which was at UC Davis. Um, a long time ago now, from 2005 to 2013. Um, and so part of that research, uh, you know, some of the, I see um, Professor Julie Z in attendance. Um, I want to thank Julie for all the mentorship and um, her and Jonathan London were instrumental actually, as I was the re research assistant and collaborator with them as a graduate student and, and really um, securing resources at UC Davis to really, I, I felt um, really provide an important um, social science, uh, foundational social science understanding of environmental justice within the Delta. So without the two of them, you know, in terms of what was going on at UC Davis, I don't know if any of this would have, these insights would have been possible, um, to be frank. And so I really appreciate, um, that's another acknowledgement. Um, and what we learned in that process and crisscrossing the state and doing ethnographic work, as well as obser um, uh, historical observations, you know, going back to archives, um, we, we looked at how environmental justice was being institutionalized, um, stemming from the 1999 legislation that you know, dovetailed with federal efforts. Um, and we saw EJ was being institutionalized in California as procedural justice, first and foremost, right? Meaningful inclusion. Um, and that was, you know, in terms of uh, uh, really around public participation and, and stakeholder kind of uh, engagement processes. And so that, that's what we found early on. Right, and, um, and that was consistent what we saw on the federal level well, as well. So you kind of see this kind of diffusion of a organizational approach to environmental justice within state agencies that um, you know, Jill Lindsay Harrison has already touched on in the seminar series. Um, we saw that kind of reflected in um, California, much to the dismay, frankly, of uh, uh, folks who are more concerned about distributive justice, right? About the, the, how resources are unequally distributed uh, and environmental hazards and so forth are unequally distributed, right? And so th those weren't being addressed um, as much. And collaborating on that, kind of thinking through that more and some of my own work um, was looking at how uh, the very fabric of the state and mostly Cal EPA and its boards, departments and offices um, 
really, and particularly during the Schwarzenegger administration, had really um, uh, developed a framework for environmental justice that um, aligned with business groups, as I show in the social uh, sociological forum article I'm citing here, that really aligned with how they had articulated environmental justice in various stakeholder um, uh, uh, engagements, right, around environmental justice, right? So certainty really being around this discourse of sound science that we see at, um, that uh, mostly business groups um, have really uh, clung on to, to, um, to, to kind of downplay or minimalize the scientific evidence um, and social science evidence um, around racial disparities, and environmental hazard exposures. Um, and, and so talk about it there, as well as fairness really going to this procedural justice kind of idea um, and how um, kind of the legal discourses around public uh, participation were kind of uh, uh, used uh, to kind of operationalize environmental justice as procedural justice. And then balance really getting into this core kind of contradiction as sociologists um, we think about when we study state institutions, right? A state we usually think of as uh, uh, a legal and bureaucratic entity, right, engages in legal and bureaucratic regulation of human activity in well-defined territories, but that it does so in a way to, to balance its contradictory commitments, right, of, um, right, protecting social welfare, environment, the environment, public health, and those kind of things of, of its citizens, but then also promoting capital accumulation for private interests, right, of, of wealth accumulation. Um, and so it has an interest in economic development and, and seeks to, um, uh, uh, to kind of balance that against its disinterestedness in, in capital accumulation, economic development and for private interests, right? And revenues are at stake, right? To, to taxation and so forth based off of that, um, those revenue, uh, the, the kind of economic development to then fund the state agencies, right? And so um, I and others have, have looked at that and how it relates to environmental justice, but that is a, that is a, um, a difficult situation for, um, as we found, for even the state officials to kind of navigate, even if they were, you know, and we kind of ran into folks and, and talking with them about how they felt like they were bumping their heads against that con contradictory logic, right? And it was kind of reified, it was made real as they, um, you know, through stakeholder processes and kind of balancing all these interests. And so I, I anticipate many in the room can relate to that experience and that, that stood out in some of the, that early research. And then in the uh, CalFed and Bay Delta area, we saw in this uh, 2009 article, um, we're looking at how environmental justice was, was institutionalized in CalFed and really um, found that to be complicated by um, the history around water, right? And water wars in California, um, but also the kind of legacies of conquest and right of conquering and, and settler colonial kind of establishment of California um, and securing resources from indigenous people um, and, and other marginalized um, populations and distributing water around the state. So then we see that the, the scale starts to really matter here, right? Of, um, and, and when um, particularly around the 1990, 1992 drought water bank, we saw right with the establishment of water marketing and um, how water rights then get institutionalized such that it is around, it's contractual around two parties. And a common kind of finding at that kind of moment of crystallization of environmental justice conceptualized as a third party, right? Externalities of trading water rights, right? Or ecosystem restoration, right? These kind of externalities that um, environmental justice is seen as through that policy apparatus and then how it's implemented. Uh, and then uh, later, uh, uh, Professor Z and others uh, looking at then how what happened after with the Delta Vision process, right? And, and looking at how EJ was institutionalized as a special interest. And that really, right, takes that kind of logic of, of uh, third parties and this kind of constituency of environmental justice groups, um, right? And seeing them as a special interest in this broader framework of certainty, fairness, and balance that was prevalent uh, throughout California. And indeed, right, we see that in other kind of EJ policies, but then focusing in on water and the co-equal goals of, right, of water supply and ecosystem restoration, right, that, that prevails, right? And so we can think about that as uh, Jill Lindsay Harrison might in some of her work, right, uh, around this kind of procedural, or I'm sorry, uh, utilitarian notions of justice, right? The greatest good for the greatest amount. And, um, and so that could be kind of also reflected here, but what's at stake then are those, those, you know, those externalities, those communities where water is flowing past, 
and they're, you know, uh, and not having access to clean and affordable and healthy water. It's not seen as a human right. Laurel Firestone and her colleague, right, have already spoken to that issue um, here. One thing I've been focusing on, and I'll talk more um, uh, in here and, in, and interested to hear kind of more how this is developing. I've really been interested from, from those experiences as a grad student in hearing and interviewing advocates who are frustrated with being seen as third parties and externalities. Um, and, and then uh, regulators and regulatory scientists of trying to think about, okay, how, what, what kind of methodological um, advances can we uh, uh, develop to really support the other really important aspects of environmental justice in California of cumulative impacts, precautionary approaches, and climate justice, right? And particularly with regard to AB 32 and more recent um, legislation and initiatives. So that's kind of where my work has stemmed from there and really then thinking, okay, right? So here's what they're saying. We need more historical analyses to understand how these externalities are produced, right? Or, the, or how advocates would say environmental injustices are produced. Um, and what does it look like when Right when you're talking with advocates and community members who what I heard in, in my interviews and field work within communities, particularly in Stockton, was right, we're concerned with food insecurity, housing, right, climate, sea level rise, um, the levee infrastructure, floods, environmental toxins, you name it, right? All these community kind of issues and uh, threats to the health and well-being. And so what I really then kind of took um, through my graduate training then after kind of collaborating on this initial research looking at EJ institutionalization was then to get more into the spatial analysis and think, okay, how can we map out these inequalities and what's the extent to which that can help us understand cumulative impacts if that is indeed one of the goals of EJ policy in California and how can that then right, help um, inform um, you know, these discussions at the science policy interface. So that's what I'm gonna be focusing on here. Um, and right, and when we think about cumulative impacts in the, amidst the climate crisis, right, we see, right, um, kind of recent UN outline of the emergency, right, of global temperatures, water, uh, food insecurity, more frequent and intense climate and weather events, um, major uh, threat to international peace and security, right, and so that's that's what we're seeing on in the international kind of discussions. Um, when we think about what that looks like locally. Um, I'm going to kind of look in the Stockton case as to kind of what I found and a way to think about, uh, you know, how, you know, these threats that we see amidst the climate crisis, how can we understand them? And again, I'm as a sociologist, but also an environmental sociologist, so I have some um, kind of interdisciplinary training, um, but I'm, again, coming mostly from sociology. And so when we think about threats and hazards, um, that helps us, right, or I should say that thinking about threats and hazards can really help us ground the study of risks that we see um, in the context of the climate crisis. And so when I think about that, um, right, risk, I think about threat of loss, right, and social vulnerability, right, we see that in a number of other kind of policy um, uh, arenas related to um, thinking about the climate crisis. And so um, there's, you know, we see in the broader kind of social science literature, particularly of a prominent theorist of risk, uh, Ulrich Beck, right? We'll talk about social vulnerability in this way, a cumulative concept that includes the means and possibilities available to individuals, societies, or whole populations to cope or not with risks, the unknown unknowns, and the social uncertainties that mark their lives. Um, and we also see it described as social disparities and disaster impacts, preparedness, um, response, and recovery. Um, right, and so we've seen this in other kind of instances, and I've also participated in um, webinars with NOAA, and so I'm citing that here if you're interested in kind of looking at how Cutter has presented some of that work in the context that's very similar to what we're talking about now. You can check that out. Um, and, and But what we see there is um, when we look at social vulnerability in that way, and as a cumulative kind of concept, and you see kind of social vulnerability indices or kind of framing it as unknown unknowns, what happens, right, um, is I argue in my work that that really obscures the very um, inequalities that contribute to um, the types of unequal distribution of risk that we see, right? And namely, I look at, in, in Stockton's case, of race and class inequalities, right? And so, um, right, so it, we have to be specific, right? And when we think about the types of um, inequalities we're looking at and the, the groups that are vulnerable, we have to attend to their 
um, the, those particular aspects um, of their vulnerability, not just because that aligns with what environmental justice advocates uh, right, have historically argued, but the nature of right, where we live in space in the United States in particular has been structured by race and class. And my other work I look at in the Flint water crisis and I've shown right, that also intersects with uh, family structures uh, and gender, right? And we see that in other cases as well. But in the Stockton case, I'm focusing on that and I have historically, and that has come up in terms of uh, community groups uh, concerns, but also central axes of power and inequality in Stockton that have uh, really shaped how people have gained access to space differentially uh, within Stockton, the broader Delta area. Um, and so, um, so what I do in my work is really kind of focus on that in the Stockton case. And so I argue against actually that social vulnerability index because I think it obscures the historical kind of axes of inequality and power that structure the unequal landscape of risk within the Delta today. Um, what else I do in my work is then to kind of engage with this other um, uh, work on double exposures, right? Um, won't go into too much here, but really what's useful about this when we think about these broader kind of discussions about global threats, right? Um, um, uh, citing Lachenko and O'Brien here, um, where they're looking at global environmental change and globalization and kind of talking about these um, abstract forces that then are having um, impacts and out, uh, unequal outcomes locally. Um, what I really like about the work is they focusing on pathways of exposure to separate and, and interacting stressors. And so I really kind of think about that in my work. And I think that could be useful when we're um, looking at, you know, how we got to where we are and uh, in, in terms of uh, climate injustices, and particularly within the Delta, um, and, and attending to that history, those pathways can then help us understand the specificity of, uh, of factors that then contribute to those unequal outcomes. And hopefully that can then inform, better inform uh, future work. Um, and so kind of going over this in, in some of the work I'm citing, um, recently uh, co-edited a, a journal, um, an issue of a journal, the Cambridge Journal of Regions, Economy and Society on um, the socio-spatial uh, challenges of climate change. And we bring in these ideas of risk scapes, right? And, and that can help us kind of take this idea of risk, the threat of loss with these broader ideas about the whole world is at risk from climate change and map it out, right? And, and really look at where those risks are unequally distributed um, how people understand them, um, you know, in terms of both space and time. And that's kind of another discussion in some of my other work. I'm focusing mostly here on the spatial, you know, um, geographic spatial dimensions of it. Um, and we can think then about, and, and looking at risky neighborhoods. And what I look at that in my own work is to think of them as these places that are kind of the hotspots within these risk scapes. Um, but as I talk more about housing, um, also uh, how elites see risks within these risk scapes. Um, we also see those as places that are uh, thought of as risky investments by elites and broader political economic structures. So when we think about risk and kind of trying to do it in a multi-dimensional way of both people who are at risk and then people who are um, right, uh, or institutional uh, forces that are also uh, central in distributing risk and, and conceptualizing where they should invest um, resources. Um, and one thing, when we talk about cumulative impacts, I've kind of, I've studied, you know, in terms of Cal and screen and see how that's been developing. Um, uh, I kind of focus on these areas of high risk neighborhoods and um, as those are where these, these multiple hotspots within these different risk scapes um, converge, right, and overlap. And you can kind of, if you were to have a heat map, right, that that would be, um, or if it was three dimensional, right, it'd look like this bar chart of where you see risk, most, uh, you know, threats, um, threat of loss, uh, being, um, you know, accumulating uh, spatially. And so that, that's kind of what I focus on are those high risk neighborhoods, both in terms of uh, the threats that are there and then also how they are understood by dominant uh, organizations and institutions. And what we know, right, is that much of those risk escapes have been structured through uneven development, right, which, um, and, uh, right, and, we see that that has historically intertwined with how our, uh, notions of racial inferiority, right, have been articulated, um, and colonial regimes have been implemented to structure capital accumulation, that is the accumulation of wealth for private interests. Um, and we see that within California, that has really contributed to, right, uh, of, of 
uh, with, you know, as I talk about and I show my work of, of uh, the kind of the racial biases in how mortgage um, insurance and credit is distributed, right, and, and exclusions for who can own what property has really structured then the intergenerational transmission of wealth along racial lines and who has access to what areas and what protections within the city or in the broader Delta region. Um, and, and that has really contributed to then, as we see in California, there's been these racial hierarchies, right? Where we see uh, white folk have had disproportionately, um, you know, on, a, on average, um, it varies throughout the state, but that have had uh, historically high levels of wealth accumulation and access to more pristine and protected environments. Um, whereas black folk, folk and Latinx folk have uh, ha had um, uh, relatively, right? And, uh, haven't had that uh, sorts of advantages. And depending on, um, where we are and what we're talking about, um, indigenous folks have also been marginalized and uh, and erased, right, um, through settler colonial processes um, uh, uh, around the California, and then various Asian and Pacific Islander folks have also been, right, uh, kind of stratified within the, these hierarchies that fluctuate throughout the state. But what we see consistently, right, an ongoing project of erasure of indigenous lands and peoples and the devaluation, segregation, and unequal poisoning of Black, Latinx, and Asian bodies in urban industrial space, right? That's what we see throughout the country, and we see that consistently throughout California on average, right? And with the kind of research that has been done has usually shown that, that um, if we're using regression analyses, right, that is the average kind of regression line findings that we see and what I'm going to present today and, and teasing apart histories of, of development in Stockton, right, that really there's divergences in, in what kind of recipes of risk accumulation, uh, devaluation, segregation, and so forth have happened throughout um, the Stockton area. Um, but we do see, though, that environmental privileges are, privileges are typically concentrated in and among white bodies and homogenous spaces. And that goes back to the very structure of the real estate industry, both in California and throughout the United States in this regard. So the, the case here, just uh, check in on time. Um, I have uh, quite a few slides I could present. So I wanna kind of um, just checking in with uh, the, the format we're using today, Karen or Jessica, um, when should, how much time do we wanna leave for, for questions and discussion? Let's try to leave the last 10 minutes. So 10 minutes, okay. Go tell. Okay, thank 50. you. And as I said, so the work I'm presenting here, and I'm happy to share you know, the, the publications that inform this presentation um, are noted here, and I, I can follow up with folks after to, to share those if they like. So in this work, um, really my research questions then, right? Given that history, and um, kind of the broader context um, that we're engaging here and then call, also kind of thinking you know, uh, back to the, those initial kind of qualitative and historical insights I gleaned um, in grad school, right? Concern then about cumulative impacts. How can we understand that the accumulation of threat of loss across all these different landscapes of risk? Um, and, and in particular, right, when we think about climate, and focusing on sea level rise, that came up consistently, and many of you could probably speak to this very, very well within the Delta area, right, of how much sea level rise and flooding, right, are of concern, and then flooding being um, historical, um, you know, a characteristic of the Bay Delta, right, and, um, and so I look at those as, as separate kind of risk scapes, um, but also how they're linked. And economic risks, um, I, I focus on here, and given the prevalence, right, that we've both when I was in grad school, right, our concern with the recovery from the Great Recession, um, and that those concerns haven't gone away, right, of, of concerns about the threat of economic um, resources and well being, right? So, um, and they're, they're intertwined, right? Um, so, the questions here to what extent are climate, environmental, and economic risks similarly concentrated among social groups and physical space in a single, met single metropolitan area? So, in that way, kind of framing the question like this, we can kind of develop a more generalized approach. Um, to, to, to then guide kind of similar inquiries elsewhere. And to what extent are such multiple risk exposures associated with neighborhood level race and class composition and urban development? So here are the three kind of risk scapes I focus on uh, in this work and, um, and then and, and treating them as their own. And so it is, you know, if you're doing spatial analysis and think about it in this way, it is this kind of layering, uh, you know, these different layers um, 
And so sea level rise risk, right? The spatial variation in human vulnerability and so uh, SLR exposure risk, flood risk ape, right? Similarly along those lines with regard to um, flood exposure risk. And then housing risk ape, we don't really think about it in this way, but I define it as spatial variation in human vulnerability and risk of adverse housing market incorporation and displacement. And right, um, so just kind of spending a little bit of time elaborating that, right, that, that um, it's really talking about, right, of a risk to people and how they're incorporated into a housing market, right? If we think about a housing market as a housing risk scape, right, we, people are adversely incorporated into it. We saw that um, in patterns of uh, redlining from as it was institutionalized in the 1930s, but it had been going on before that, right? The biased um, distribution of, of mortgage insurance and credit based off the, the demographic composition of, of mostly the neighborhoods uh, and then the people who are lending there, all with an eye towards, right, of maintaining homogenous space as uh, real estate markets were being developed. The idea, and this is a fault of sociology at that time for sure, right, back to Chicago school, was the thought that if you had diverse people mingling in space that could breed conflict. Um, and, and what was thought then as most desirable investments, particularly recovering from the Great Depression, was uh, white homogenous spaces and other homogenous space, right? White homogenous spaces being those that were also seen as more investment worthy, um, but then uh, making sure that the way that mortgage uh, insurance and credit was distributed, as well as what kind of, um, uh, exclusions were put in place around home ownership, right? We're put in an infrastructure to make homogenous neighborhoods, but also separate neighborhoods um, and homogenous in terms of right, being uh, segregated spaces, particularly for people of color and indigenous folks away from more white affluent neighborhoods, right? So that, that speaks to that history, right? That's un undisputed history. We've seen that throughout the country um, in plenty of cases. And that definitely applies in Stockton throughout the Delta, but I've seen it in Stockton, studied it, Jesus Hernandez has shown that uh, in Sacramento, for example, and um, we've also seen plenty of case studies of that in the Bay Area. Right, so that speaks to that one aspect of risk in the housing market of adverse incorporation into it. So then you come in, right, in a, uh, in a position where one, given your background, marginalized background, racially marginalized background, is not are not able to accumulate wealth and is adversely incorporated into that market. We also saw that though with uh, the rise of subprime loans uh, and then the targeting of those credit deprived marginalized spaces um, with high interest rates, right? So that's also another kind of indicator of adverse housing market incorporation. So then the threat, the other threat then is also displacement, right? And then displacement from um, home uh, ownership, right? And so this is kind of multi kind of textured um, uh, a way in which housing risk escapes manifest um, that we've seen historically and that contribute to foreclosure risk. Um, and using Lachenko and O'Brien's work, we can think about that and I conceptualize the housing risk escape as a central contextual environment that intertwines risk exposures, right, um, through right, all these different uh, uh, risk escapes, right? And so if the how that's the key institutional context by which we are sorted spatially, and as I've shown in the Stockton case, um, it's relational, right? That um, and how neighborhoods, right? Location matters, but also the people in those locations matter and that they're graded differentially by the composition of the neighborhood and who's there um, and what um, racial identities are most highly valued or, or devalued during that time period. Um, and that uh, uh, fluctuates given who is seen as a prevailing threat, right? Um, and, and particularly a threat to those who are in power. So the Stockton case, where you see flood risk and SLR exposure risk are unequally distributed in Stockton. Um, the Stockton was devastated, right? As many of you know, during the housing crisis and great recession. Uh, it was top six um, in, of the 100 largest US metro uh, areas for uh, white Asian segregation. Um, Fitzgerald, right, a, a columnist in the Stockton area, uh, going back to 2001 article, <laughs> reflected how Stockton was quite diverse, but also re reflected um, how um, right, Martin Luther uh, King Jr. had a dream and it wasn't Stockton. Right? There's this quote, and so uh, you can see a lot of Fitzgerald's kind of reflecting on the state of inequality uh, within Stockton. So the research strategy that um, you know, this work um, 
I'm sharing with you was based off of um, a lot of archival work going back from 1850 to 2010. The key variable I'm looking at here is estimated uh, sea level rise exposure risk uh, for 139 census tracts. Um, and then I did a content analysis and what's called a qualitative comparative analysis or QCA um, and mix that in, in in a GIS to uncover diverse pathways to SLR exposure risk, right? And so having that outcome, right? I'm really looking then, I look at historically how that outcome, um, that unequal distribution, right? Then is intertwined with how we see all these other threats of loss um, infused in these other risk scapes and really tying it together. Um, that goes back to then because thinking about these um, pathways towards exposure. Um, and I could talk more about the data sources in terms of um, you know, SLR risk, um, but kind of zooming us in here, right? This is um, uh, Stockton within the United States context and uh, using uh, what I show here is gray, that's estimated one meter tidally adjusted sea level rise uh, uh, overlaid onto the um, Stockton metropolitan area, San Joaquin County, and then zooming in, um, looking at that layer and where it over overlaps with tracks, um, we see these ones uh, estimate, you know, with estimated exposure. But what's key here in the data that I'm using um, uh, with sea level rise exposure risk, that doesn't take into that that modeling doesn't take into account right uh, levee infrastructure. And so when I was doing this work, um, I uh, got the the classifications of unacceptable levees from U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, and, and looked at two kind of ways in which they were labeled as unacceptable, right? And one involved encroachments, which is more uh, speaks to right uh, development and uh, and the use of land that has made those. Uh, that those that levy the uh, infrastructure vulnerable to failure, um, whereas the structural instability speaks to right um, aspects of upkeep and maintenance that are uh, beyond um, right uh, uh, homeowners improvements and and those kind of things um, the nearby or kind of residential development um, that would lead to kind of what we think of those improvements and and those improvements are really right the what we see in the um, in the north end right, of Spanos Park West, Twins Creek area, right, where like, uh, right, the, the encroachments onto the, the uh, levees, right, were kind of made to, or uh, a result of people, um, right, trying to get their boats onto the waterways to recreate in the Delta, which, you know, people do quite a lot. But then the structural, one, the more structural we see in the South End, and that gets to, right, a, a, a important history of exclusion and divestment in South Stockton. Um, that is beyond people's and developers encroachments onto the levees, right? It speaks to that divestment um, and history of exclusion in South Stockton that I'll get to. So you put those two together, those different data sources, and that can help you then um, get into, right, uh, mapping out these unequal exposures. And then tying back to the levees and that history of flooding, we then see, um, as I'll show, uh, how right that that history is linked together um, through the history of flooding and and development uh, and exclusion within Stockton. So first we see um, go, you know go, historically um, indigenous erasure right lands uh, and lives of many of Stockton's Miwok and Yokut tribal members were taken, especially when we reflect on the Calaveras River near Stockton right of being related to skulls and the, the naming of that river relating to that indigenous erasure and as many have argued, right, uh, genocidal uh, uh, treatment of Miwok and Yoku, right? Uh, what was left after um, settler uh, arrival uh, and development um, while Miwok, Yoku and other indigenous folks were moved to the Bay Area and out uh, from ancestral lands within Stockton and at, and what's importantly out of some of the most pristine um, environments within the Stockton area, which were they had ancestral lands uh, historically there. Right, and reflecting the historical exclusion of American Indians from, as I wrote uh, in 2019, um, of American Indians from elite white settlements in California, no American Indians uh, resided as of 2000 in the elite green graded UOP neighborhood, right? And so that's from, I was looking at um, uh, initial um, maps uh, that 
um, by the Homeowners Loan Corporation that were showing where um, the most desirable residential areas were. Those are green lined. Um, and we look at those places, particularly around the University of the Pacific, which had historically been the, the, uh, the, the main um, kind of uh, neighborhood for investments uh, and in real estate and the infrastructure put in place to make them racially exclusive for white elite folks within Stockton, right? That had also been an important area for American Indians folks, but not, and particularly Miwok and Yoku, there, no, no, no one who identified as American Indian were there in 2000, right? It speaks to that erasure. And that's an example of the map in terms of just thinking cautious of time here. Um, and, and so this is what it looks like in, in um, you know, gray scale. And there's a lot going on in this map, but um, the UOP uh, neighborhood is over here. Um, and uh, and right, we see the, those gradations, right? And I'm mapping here are deed restrictions. And th so those are racially restrictive covenants that are put in place to block uh, non-white ownership of that land. And you see that put in place fairly well um, around the University of the Pacific as of the 1930s. Um, and those areas that were then predominantly redlined um, and uh, didn't have any of those racial exclusions, that was where people of color could go to find housing. And the, the, the development and the, the housing stock was subpar, building enforcements were quite lax, um, and it was kind of what was left over. And where those mapped on were to historical areas of uh, where people of color in Stockton had been segregated and excluded. But we also see, right, the convergence of class where we see folks from who had been migrating to the uh, from California during the Dust Bowl, um, who identified as white, but were also low income and poor, right? Also living in red line areas. So we see this class matters, and some of the particularities of these neighborhoods matter in how um, you know the pathways of how they got there. There's a lot in that map I won't unpack now, but this is from another publication. And then thinking about this as we move forward. Um, I focus on a case of the 1955 flood in Stockton. And um, uh, here, this is a kind of a simpler map um, where we get to uh, that time period, um, helping us think then about the flood. And if any, many of you, or some of you might be familiar with that flood, right? Uh, there had been a break at a nearby dam, uh, um, uh, quite a distance away actually, but uh, and with historical floods, and uh, some term to atmospheric river uh, that had brought the floods and, um, and that there was this flood, right? And if you look at archives, they talk about Stockton and other parts of the Delta very severely impacted. You'll see, right, the Christmas flood of 1955 as harming the area uh, uh, overall in uh, very uh, harmful ways. But what we see is that those floodwaters were channeled in to uh, disproportionately uh, South Stockton and the West Side, and that it, all, it somewhat overlaps with the historical kind of redlining in Stockton. Um, and what we're getting to here is then about development, right? And those flood protections that were put in place were paved over for urban renewal in Stockton. And what I'm mapping here is um, looking at places that were identified in uh, newspaper articles. Uh, and regulatory reports as those that experienced the flood with the worst during that time period. So it came down, right, these waterways and onto these streets and down Mormon uh, Channel uh, that had been paved over um, and other kind of flood protections removed to put in parking lots and those kind of things for urban renewal. And those urban, urban renewal initiatives were put in place to then, right, renew those redlined areas and capital starved areas and segregated areas um, for redevelopment. Um, but what instead what happened here, a major flood and devastated the predominantly um, uh, people of color uh, neighborhoods in uh, South Stockton and, and even uh, south of that. Um, and so the hatching here, I'm looking at this convergence. I'm just kind of thinking about this layering of threat of loss and then the experience of loss, right? We see, um, right? Uh, hazardous, you know, uh, red line tract up here um, in uh, near the diverting canal, right, where water was supposed to be taking, uh, floodwaters were supposed to be going out to the delta that way, right, some of it came in here, um, but not so much in, in the uh, low income white uh, neighborhoods that had been redlined, right, it really, and you see the, the over, um, the other, uh, like with South Stockton and the West Side, right? Some areas that had been redlined, 
so it wasn't a full story, complete, you know, one one correspondence with where they redlined, then targeted for flood. But you do see that along this line uh, here, right? The the cross hatched areas where we see the convergence of uh, right of being redlined, being capital starved, segregated, and excluded from wealth accumulation opportunities for it, and then also the experience of flood hazards and, and uh, loss there during that time period. I'm gonna kind of go over that. Th those slides really get into then how some of that history uh, uh, then uh, progresses going forwards and from 1970 to 2000. And what we see during the, the time period then is a push to uh, uh, right to outlaw right and 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 stop the practice of redlining explicitly right even though there had been a series of fair housing acts that had tried to do so um, and. Uh, right, and so I kind of map out where that that redlining then happened in the 1970s with additional archiving archival data, and we see a lot of that does overlap quite well with 1930s redlining. But then we see it with more data. We see right other places, the Delta Islands and others that were also uh, uh, redlined, and then uh, looking at then um, kind of looking thinking about that context and the real estate market and how people were then sorted and patterns of neighborhood change unfolded um, in relation to Stockton's desegregation order, right? That was um, where it was found, the Stockton Unified uh, School District was also found to be segregating their schools. Um, and so that really then changed some of the residential landscape and people and leading to white and capital flight from Stockton and a further um, devaluation of Stockton's South Side. Um, and so the, what I do then, um, kind of moving forward here in just interest of time, is develop a way to then code that history, right? And, and so this table here just shows then the subsequent analysis that I'll summarize of, uh, of using qualitative comparative analysis, which looks at rather than a regression analysis and finding an average pattern that summarizes you know, the observations in, in your analysis, it really it uses Boolean algebra uh, encoding in this case, right? Crisp comparisons of, you know, did it have some kind of condition present, right? Um, or, or was it um, or absent? And then looking at the combinations of basically zeros and ones based off of that coding that uh, contribute um, or consistently contribute to an outcome being present. Um, and so that's why I kind of conceptualize it here as contemporary race and class vulnerability and then racialized uneven development and multiple risk exposure. Thinking about that history and also I didn't get a chance to really talk about it, but the subprime loan um, mortgage uh, distribution throughout Stockton and that how that contributes to threat of foreclosure and what we see there and actual then those areas that did have high foreclosure rates helps us then think about right that structuring of, of being neighborhoods being labeled as risk adversely incorporated in the housing market experiencing flood exposures um, right and uh, and let levy poor levy upkeep and then right uh, and then experiencing um, further adverse market incorporation leading up to the Great Recession and then foreclosure risk and then sea level rise. So it's that sequencing, that pathway, in addition to then how does that combine with more contemporary race and class demographics? Um, and so this table won't make sense right now in the amount of time we have. So I'm just gonna kind of map out some of these, um, the, these findings. And so looking at that history and the analysis helps us then speak to, right, what are the unique pathways by which both areas that have historically been, been um, uh, privileged in North Stockton come to be, uh, you know, experiencing elevated exposure or uh, uh, risk of exposure to sea level rise versus those that have been historically marginalized in South Stockton, right? It helps us kind of think about those divergent pathways to perhaps similar kind of outcomes. So the analysis uh, we see, right, that um, the first solution, right, we see above average levels of Asian and black residents combined with a history of adverse housing market incorporation, right, being redlined, um, and then also having high levels of subprime loans and the displacement, foreclosure risk, right, um, uh, and then also having kind of the involuntary imposed risky flood protections within the risk scape, right, seems to be associated with the types of vulnerabilities of SLR exposure risk we see in the box tract neighborhood, um, what, what, we, what we could call the North Seaport uh, neighborhood, West and Ranch West and West and Ranch East. We see um, 
though a different recipe of risk in the North End, right? Spanos Park and Twins Creek, right above average levels of Asian and Black residents. That's understood in the context of, right, that white and capital flight um, uh, that was preconditioned by uh, the desegregation and then the move towards Lodi and leaving Stockton from white and elite uh, families. Um, and then encroachments, right, that the developments that had been uh, kind of put in place that had, had been uh, impairing uh, those, um, those, those levies. And then taking us back, right, one thing that's useful about this analysis too is that it helps us think about kind of other plausible pathways um, for particular areas, right? So like Boggs Tract and then South Seaport. Boggs Tract has, this could potentially be another recipe of risk that could be in, in, important in, in understanding the Boggs Tract neighborhoods um, uh, vulnerability, right? So contemporary status as a diverse non-white and low-income area, Latinx, Asian, Black, low-income, and it's historically been that way. Um, intertwining with the history of racialized risk of adverse housing market incorporation and involuntarily imposed risky flood protections, right? Flooded in 1955, redlined in the 1970s, uh, included in Stockton Unified School District um, a boundary that had then been seen as a kind of a hazard for real estate investment and for white and elite folks to live in when it was being desegregated. Subprime, high levels of subprime loans, and then also structurally uh, unacceptable levies and similar recipe then for the South Seaport neighborhood. And finally, um, we think about, you know, the, this additional tract here, um, right, the country club, historically privileged, seen as an important investment uh, opportunity for elites and within the local real estate industry, but then, right, put in the context of, of desegregation and uh, how that area has developed from the 1970s, 2000s, you see that, right, some of its recipes of risk for a very, comparable low level of risk, right? That if you recall from the map and I'm showing here, um, right, it, there's very minimal amount of that tract that is thought to be kind of at risk of exposure to sea level rise. But nonetheless, right, it was a Stockton Unified School District tract, has extensive encroachments that have impaired local levy quality, at least at the time of, of the 2010, and then above average levels of, of black and uh, low income households. Right, and so what we see across even those diverse pathways a consistent theme, um, right, are above average levels of, of Black residents in each one of those at-risk neighborhoods. And so that speaks to then that history, and as I show in my work, of anti-Black racism within Stockton and how that, um, that history then also structures contemporary vulnerabilities. So even if, though we have these diverse pathways, you, when you do this kind of analysis, you can see then that there are these consistent factors and, and being particularly above average levels of Black residents in each one of these at-risk neighborhoods of at-risk, uh, high-risk neighborhoods, right, speaks to then an enduring in inequality and vulnerability within the Stockton area that we can identify with this type of analysis that can inform um, then how we think about addressing the climate and crisis and injustice in Stockton. So do I have, sorry, I think I've gone over about four minutes, um, but I can, I'm happy to have more of a discussion and follow up with folks as well. Thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Livianos. That was a great talk. Really appreciated the context you provided us of environmental justice institutionalization in California um, and how you brought that into your work in the Delta and then carried that into the Stockton case study. So um, I will remind everyone all of our talks are recorded and available on the council website and on the YouTube channel in case you want to go back and revisit any of those slides, but with the remaining time, we're happy to take questions. And if, ever, if folks can either use the chat box or raise your hand and we'll call on hands as we see them come up. Well, while we're waiting for a question to come in, I can kick it off. Um, since you've had this history of work in the Delta and looking at sort of EJ policy implementation and policy dialogue over time, I'm curious if you have observed changes and where you think there might be lessons learned from some of your work and other efforts to institutionalize EJ and what that might 
you know, what you might suggest could be carried forward in the Delta. Mm -hmm. um, that's, <clears throat> but so I'm, what I'm hoping, and this, there's a question as well from uh, Stephen Osgood, uh, are solutions the same way as pathways? Uh, yeah, so that when I'm gonna that, that um, yeah, so qualitative compared analysis, the solutions are those pathways, right? And so it's a solution to the, not, not a solution like this is what should be happening, right? To address the problem, it's it's a, it's a um, speaking to the, the numerical solution to that equation problem, right? Of how do those, the zeros and ones come together? And so that, that's what I was, uh, thank you for that clarifying question. Um, so on that point, then what I've, what I've learned is, right, that much of, much of the kind of way in which right, EJ has been conceptualized is participation. And so um, it was pretty clear, right, that much of like what I've uncovered and others have uncovered in, in their analyses of distributional inequalities is that um, throughout the Delta and elsewhere <clears throat> is that right, you can invite people to the table uh, as much as you want and have an inclusion, but does that really translate into addressing those material inequalities, right, and, and the unequal kind of distribution of threat of loss and livelihoods. Um, uh, and it's clear it doesn't, right? Um, and so that that's one thing, right? Um, but that if we go back to what like, California has really, with Cal and Bioscreen, and there's other work I'm doing to kind of bring all this together with Cal and Bioscreen, I think that's what has to be done, right, to really, right, you put that history with the Cal and Bioscreen indicators that you know, Cal EPA and OEHA have, right, you can get a, at a sense of, right, okay, those areas that are then being targeted for redistribution, right, with the greenhouse um, cap and trade auction revenues for then redevelopment, is it, and many are kind of looking at that then, okay, is it, you know, the, the redevelopment funds that are coming in to those neighborhoods, those SB 375, right, um, that's probably not the right number, um, right? But that, right, the, the disadvantaged communities that are identified with Cal and virus screen that are targeted with those um, uh, reinvestment funds, right? Is it beautification? Is it, what's really happening? Is it really addressing those material inequalities? And it, um, that's an empirical question and people are kind of looking into that and, it, and I'd be interested if anyone could speak to that question. But I think that kind of analysis should be done within the Delta to then, to look at that, right? You have a program in place that's ostensibly about addressing um, environmental inequalities. Is it doing that? Um, is it doing it also the folks who have a historically experienced exclusion and inequality in those areas? Um, but you're gonna run into problems with that. And a good, um, I think, case to think about is um, with, you know, recently with the effort to then um, really try to, to wrong, or I'm sorry, to correct historical injustices and wrongs against black farmers, right? And we see with, um, initiatives that are being put in place to then help them get access to credit uh, to pay off agricultural lands, their homes, and how much political um, you know, disputes that is unfolded with or intertwined with. But that's a good important kind of example to think about, okay, what would that look like in the Delta? And, um, and, and how can that be put in place to address the type of inequalities that people are, have historically experienced and continue to experience today? Great, thank you. Um, well, we are at the hour. Uh, if folks want to continue on and enter more questions here, um, if Dr. Livianos has time to stay on, we can do yeah. that. Otherwise, we really thank everyone for joining and for your presentation today. It was a great conclusion to the series and really appreciate bringing it back to the Delta. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Livianos. Thank you. And again, happy to. Um, there's a question about spatial map display, the zip codes of the areas exposed to flood risk. I, usually, I try to stay away from zip codes because for historical analyses, um, those are uh, right zip codes can change. And so um, that would be a whole nother level of complexity in terms of, right, then I'd have to go back to the blocks to try to like, you know, look at zip code layers over time. And then, um, and so I try to stick with tracks and also that uh, there's publicly available data that has tracks that have been standardized over the years to then really kind of make that, um, you know, facilitate that kind of analysis. So I usually, I, I don't use zip codes. I use uh, census tracks is usually my largest unit of analysis. And then 
if I'm doing more cross-sectional work, um, like the Flint water crisis stuff, that's I get to the finest level I can and that's blocks. Um, and I should say that um, the, the point about the sea level rise data, so that's from Climate Central and um, they had produced that, right? There's a series of, of studies um, 2015 and then thereafter um, where they had done the modeling then under all these different scenarios. And I took the, the, um, the most common one about the one meter rise, of, um, projected rise to, um, to, two, uh, 2000, to 2100. Um, and so I use that, but there's others that you can get. So that, that's full credit to them. What I did is ha take, took that as my sea level rise layer and then um, integrated it with my other data in GIS. But what's key about that and their main disclaimer is their um, their sea level rise projections don't take into account um, a levee infrastructure. And so that's why it's really key to bring in right the any kind of le levy data you have uh, to then really then think about, OK, where what, what are the subpar levies that might be uh, uh, vulnerable to failure with that sea level rise? Um, so that's that's important caveat with that. Um, but that said, right, following that so it was kind of it was up to that 2010 point so um after that then right that's 11 years ago now um there has been work uh, and some of you may know right to then address that those substandard levies and, and improve them and that really right some attribute that to kind of what we see with the um federal initiatives that were put in place after hurricane katrina um and so there have been changes and i talk about that a little bit but um we still see them that there's there, uh, right? That that's an empirical question as to then what what that would look like, you know, and then how it might address the problem. But there has been efforts to address these for sure. Well, good motivation for everyone to read the paper and see in detail the findings. <laughs> and I'm I'm All curious. Right. So uh, yeah, if there's anyone else that I mean, um, again, I know we're constrained with time, but if anyone else kind of who's working on any of this stuff or I don't know, has other kind of insights again. So I kind of went up to that, you know, 2010 time period and a little bit after that. And so it's kind of bounded around that time period, but it was kind of thinking about using that history from eight, back to 1850 to think about development and, and kind of methodological approaches. But yeah, I, I could learn also as to what, what's going on now and how folks are kind of thinking about this stuff. And see, I don't know if Catherine has a question. Yeah, go ahead, Catherine. No, I wondered if you could repeat your email address. Yeah, I'll put it. Um, Thank you. You had yeah. it like just a second and I didn't get a picture. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's okay, but I'll put it in the chat. Um, Thank you. That's the best because it's still there and we can copy it later. We saw a question in the chat if you could post the link to the paper. Yes. Um, oh. Let's see. Okay, are there other questions from folks? So I have a couple minutes while we're, while we're still on for those who can stay. Yeah, let me, while I'm, if I could, I have to dig up that link. Um, let's see. We can also post the link with the recording. So yeah, if that, folks if that's, can revisit it. If it be yeah, because um, I have other, I have, um, yeah, it'll just take me more time than I'd want to spend trying to find that link right now, sorry. Yeah, no, that worked, we'll be in yeah. touch. All right, well, a warm thank you from everyone. Dr. Levianos, great presentation. Thank you for concluding our series here. It was really, um, uh, I'm so grateful for your time and for your work here. So well, thank thanks you. for sharing with us and um, looking forward to continuing the conversation. Continuing. That's great. Thanks for everyone for yeah, coming thanks. for your interest and in all the work that you're doing there. I, I miss it. And yeah, hopefully you all are well and particularly during this difficult time. Um, you as well. All right, we'll, we'll close here. So thanks everyone and hope to see you all in 2022.